Well, good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, whatever you guys got going on right now. I uh, just wanted to give you the homework assignment. It's an Ed Puzzle, mostly open-ended questions. Um, if you don't get to this tonight, then we'll obviously probably look into this tomorrow and go from there. Uh, but I'm going to read the beginning parts of this sort of journey that Odysseus goes on to, which is going to inform your blog writing process for tomorrow. So really all you have to do right now is sit back and enjoy um, and kind of enjoy this reading. I will probably stop, pause, and there will be some open-ended questions to think about and answer in the text, and that will prompt you when that time comes. But until that moment, uh, it's just going to be me reading. So follow along as best you can. Engage with your ears. I know you don't have the text in front of you, but we will go forward from there. So if you could please go ahead and just enjoy and pay attention. All right, here we go. This is uh, the Odyssey. As Circe spoke, dawn mounted her golden throne, and on the first ray, Circe left me, taking her way like a great goddess up the island. I made straight for the ship, roused up the men to get abroad, to get aboard and cast off at the stern. They scrambled to their places by the rowlocks, and all in line dipped oars in the gray sea. But soon an offshore breeze blew to our liking, a canvas bellying breeze, a lusty shipmate sent by the singing nymph with sunbright hair. So we made fast the braces and we rested, letting the wind and steersmen work the ship, the crew being now silent before me. I addressed them, sore at heart. Dear friends, more than one man or two should know those things Circe foresaw for us and shared with me. So let me tell her forecast. Then we die with our eyes open, if we are going to die, or know what death we baffle if we can. Sirens weaving a haunting song over the sea we are to shun, she said. And their green shore all sweet with clover, yet she urged that I alone should listen to their song. Therefore, you are to tie me up tight as a splint, erect along the mast, lashed to the mast. And if I shout and beg to be untied, take more turns of the rope to muffle me. I rather dwelt on this part of the forecast, while our good ship made time bound outward down the wind for the strange island of Sirens. Then all at once the wind fell, and a calm came over all the sea, as though some power lulled the swell. The crew were on their feet briskly to furl the sail and stow it. Then each in place, they poised the smooth oar blades and sent the white foam scudding by. I carved a massive cake and beeswax into bits and rolled them in my hands until they softened. No long task, for a burning heat came down from Helios, lord of high noon. Going forward, I carried wax along the line and laid it thick on their ears. They tied me up, then plumb amidships back to the mast lashed to the mast and took themselves again to rowing. Soon as we came smartly within hailing distance, the two sirens noting our fast ship off their point made ready and they sang. The lovely voices and ardor appealing over the water made me crave to listen and I tried to say, untie me to the crew jerking my brows, but they bent steady to the oars. Then Perimides got to his feet, he and Eurekalis, and passed more line about to hold me still and passed more line about to hold me still, so all rode on until the sirens dropped under the sea rim and their singing dwindled away. My faithful company rested on their oars now, peeling off the wax that I had laid thick on their ears and set me free. But scarcely had that island faded in blue air than I saw smoke and white water with sound of waves and tumult, a sound the men heard, and it terrified them. Oars flew from their hands. The blades went knocking wild alongside till the ship lost way. With no oar blades to drive, to drive her through the water, while I walked up and down from bow to stern, trying to put heart into them, standing over every oarsman, saying gently, Friends, we have never been in danger before this. More fearsome is it now than when the Cyclops penned us in his cave? What power he had! Did I not keep my nerve and use my wits to find a way out for us? Now I say by hook or crook, this peril sh too shall be something that we remember. Heads up, lads! We must obey the orders as I give them. Get the oar shafts in your hands and lay back hard on your benches. Hit these breaking seas! Zeus, help us pull away before we found her. You at the tiller, listen and take in all that I say. The rudders are the duty. Keep her out of the, of the combers and the smoke. Steer for that headland. Watch the drift or we fetch up in the smother and you drown us. That was all, and it brought them round to action. But as I sent them on towards Scylla, I told them nothing, as they could do nothing. They would have dropped their oars again in panic to roll for cover under the decking. Circe's bidding against arms had slipped my mind, so I tied on my curious and took up two heavy spears, then made my way along to the foredeck, thinking to see her first from there, the monster of the gray rock harboring torment for my friends. I strained my eyes upon that cliffside, veiled in cloud, but nowhere could I catch sight of her. 
And all this time, in travail sobbing, gaining on the current, we rode into the strait, Sila to port, and our great steer starboard beam, Sharbatus, dire gorge of the sea salt tide. By heaven, when she vomited, all the sea was like a cauldron, seething over intense fire when the mixture suddenly heaves and rises. The shot spumed, soared to the landside heights and fell like rain. But when she swallowed the seawater down, we saw the funnel of the maelstrom, heard the rock bellowing all around, and dark sand raged on the bottom far below. My men all blanched against the gloom. Our eyes were fixed upon that yawning mouth in fear of being devoured. Then Sila made her strike, whisking six of my best men from the ship. I happened to glance aft at ship and oarsmen and caught sight of their arms and legs dangling high overhead. Voices came down to me in anguish, calling my name for the last time. A man surf casting on a point of rock for bass or mackerel, whipping his long rod to drop the sinker and the bait far out. will hook a fish and rip it from the surface to dangle, wriggling through the air. So these were borne aloft in spasms toward the cliff. She ate them as they shrieked there in her den, in the dire grapple, reaching still for me, and deathly pity ran me through at this at that sight. Far the worst I ever suffered, questing the passes of the strange sea. We rode on, the rocks were now behind, Sharbatus too, and Skyla dropped astern. All right, that's it.